I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Our speaker today is one of our own. Uh, most of you know him as Jerry Fritz. And as a little bit of introduction, I'll, I'll go back. People our age probably remember his father, Ted Fritz, who was the premier scoutmaster in this area. Bodie Scott was a member. Uh, Hunter Wright, Bill Ring, uh, Boots Dew, me, Bill Green. It was quite a, quite a unit. And uh, Jerry was the youngest of three and he, uh, as a DB graduate, just like his wife, uh, he went to Virginia Tech and then was in the Navy. He taught school at the Naval Academy and had a career in the Navy and retired as a commander. And I'm going to leave all the rest to you, Jerry. Okay. Good morning. Thank, thanks, everybody, for coming out. I. I don't know how this is going to work out. This is, this is, a, this is the first try at trying to go around and how many people here, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people have gone around and driving down the road and you see one of these signs on the side of the road and you say, gosh, one of these days I'm going to stop, I'm going to read what that sign says. Today's the day. Well, today's the day that you're going to get a chance to do that. Um, I would not recommend that you do that in the future. As I went around and every time I stopped, let's just take one for example at Wilcox Drive. I drove down Wilcox, I was going to go get the Avery Treaty sign and the John Donaldson flotilla sign. <clears throat> so I'm driving down the road and I said, this is not going to work out too well. So I turned around and went back, went down the sluice road to where the bridge was and parked under there, walked back up along the guardrail and all these people are whizzing by and here I am, I'm walking along with a camera in my hand and they're going, what are And they're looking at you like that and that, that happened just about every place that I went. So hopefully you won't have to do that. Uh, so at any rate, okay, go back, I'm sorry. I got really going here. As you can see, there are various rail uh, road markers. The blue stars were the Tennessee Highway, I mean the Tennessee Historical Commission. Those are the those are where those are the approximate locations of the ones in the Kingsport area. Uh, the Heritage Trail is downtown Kingsport. There are ten large plaques down there. The DAR and others are also listed on this map. The two red stars that you see up there are the ones that are missing. Okay. How do you know they're missing? I've already covered that part. There's a question. He had a question. How do you know they're missing? I'm sorry? How do you know they're missing? They're not there. They're not there. <laughs> I happen to have pictures of them. And they are no longer on the road. Are they anywhere? They're gone. I contacted uh, Lynn, what was her name? Lynn Wyatt or whatever it was. From uh, Wynn, I guess it was, from the Tennessee uh, Historical Commission. And she said, we know the one for Island Road is missing, but we didn't know the one at Eaton Fort was missing. And that one was up by, by uh, I'll get to that later, but that one was up by Little Pando on 126. So, moving right along, uh, I've arranged this presentation in three areas. The first area would be the, the road markers. The second area would be the downtown uh, Heritage Trail, and then the third would be the the uh, houses or places that are on the National Registry of Historical Places, managed by the National Park Service. 
uh, in addition to the roadside historical markers that were placed um, by the commission, the, there was also markers placed by the Daughters of the American Revolution, D-A-R, Daughters of the American Colonists. I had never heard of them before. That happens to be the one that you'll see out at Duck Island. The Boy Scouts, the Junior League of Kingsport, Tennessee Eastman, the Association for the Preservation of Tennessee Antiquities, and the National Park Service National Registry. <clears throat> Each of these historical markers has a backstory in its own, own right, which probably could be a presentation on its own. But I'll try and highlight some of these things as I go along. <clears throat> and see what we can find. Turn this around the right way. Uh oh, there we go. And I tried to arrange these in a rough chronological order to try and give it some kind of coherence. And also to help tell the story that as America grew, the westward expansion came right through Kingsport which is kind of, kind of interesting. The Great Indian Warrior Path, this is the one that's out on Duck Island, and that was placed by the Daughters of the American Colonists. And as you can see, it was also laid upon, um, it starting in 1722 in early treaties with Northern Indian nations and colonies, the Great Indian Warrior Path, Trading Path, or the Philadelphia Wagon Road stretched from the Great Lakes to Augusta, Georgia and passed through our area with a branch that headed to what is now Nashville. It followed old animal pathways and old Indian trails. <coughs> uh, the marker was located on, I said that before, the marker was located on Duck Island. Island Road and Art, this is the one that's missing. was completed in 1761. It was the first wagon road in Tennessee. It ran from Chilhowee, Virginia, all the way to Long Island. At the end of Long Island, the, uh, the colon, the, well, I guess they were pioneers, um, <coughs> constructed Fort Robinson. William Byrd led 600 Virgin, Virginia militia, militia from Fort Robinson in 1761 against the Cherokees after the Fort Loudoun massacre. This marker was placed in the early 1930s as a Fort Robinson marker. As you can see, there is no foundation or no remains of Fort Robinson at all. Even the brass plaque that was on this has been stolen. I have no idea where it went, but that's all that's left, Fort Robinson. <clears throat> Actually, this is by the confluence of the South and North Holston River, which seems to be, according to most of the descriptions that I read, a good idea of where Fort Robinson was, was closer to that end, you know, down past the Netherlands end. Daniel Boone's Trail from North Carolina to Kentucky passed through here in 1769 and shown on these DAR markers. As an aside, Boone was born in Oley Valley, Pennsylvania, close to Reading, Pennsylvania. My father was born there. My dad, like Boone, trudged down from Pennsylvania to what is now Tennessee. Dad stayed, Boone went on to Kentucky. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that I've bounded my search 
by Interstate 81 on the east, the South Holston River on the south, the North Holston River on the west, and the Virginia state line to the north. However, there was one additional sign uh, that, I, that I wanted to include, and that was the one, uh, one of the Gate City signs, and that was also to John Donaldson, which we'll see later on. But Donaldson, this is the Gate City marker for Donaldson's Indian line. Um, he surveyed a treaty line in 1771 based on the Treaty of Lockerbur in 17, of 1770, but it appears that he fudged the line way west of where it was in the treaty, and it opened up a lot more territory that was, that was Cherokee and, and I think Pawnee and maybe Iroquois Indian land. Um, by the way, Gate City is unique. They have taken their signs and they've placed all five of them in a, in a line right by the road, one right after the other. Starting, the first one there is the Carter Musical Family, goes all the way to Donaldson's line at the end. Well, when I saw that over there in Gate City, I couldn't help but think, whoops. Yeah. I couldn't think of another great American tradition than that with Burma shade. How many of you, when you were growing up, you read the Burma shade signs when you were going along, oh, yeah. and you and your parents made you count white horses or count the models of cars and all that stuff as you're driving? <laughs> so that, that actually made me think of that. The first resident in Kingsport, the first permanent resident in Kingsport, was Colonel Gilbert Christian. Uh, <clears throat> he had a land grant and he tried to settle here in 1761 that failed. And he tried again in 1776 and stayed. By 1802, he had sold lands or had lots prepared and sold lands that resulted in uh, the Netherland Inn area. This plaque is down by the Netherland Inn uh, on the, if you're facing the Netherland Inn, it would be to your, to your left. <clears throat> As a result of his land grant and the, and the lots that he, that he, that he, uh, that he sold, the first town in this area was called Christianville. Now, there was also, I found mention of a Colonel James King who built a fortified stone built grist mill at the south of Reedy Creek in 1774. So there's, there's a this is the first mention of a king, and this was Colonel James King from 1774. Back on Island Road, here's another missing sign. <clears throat> Amos Hilton Eaton built a fort in 1774, and by 1776 it held about 2,200 riflemen who engaged and defeated Chief Dragon from Canoe, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the, the Tennessee Historical Commission was not aware that this sign was missing. I, I, I have no idea what happened to it. As an aside, each one of these markers are paid for either by a volunteer, we'll talk about that later, or or somebody who wants to sponsor them. <clears throat> but those signs cost $1,450 a piece. Which is, if you steal it, or if you deface it, or if you destroy it, that is a Class D felony, because it's over $1,000. Um, 
So it's not to be taken lightly that these are missing. Now, I don't know what to do about the brass plaque from Fort Robinson. <laughs> That's been gone forever, as far as I know. <clears throat> okay, 1776, mm -hmm. the, first, the first battle <clears throat> on July the 20th, 1776, these, ri these riflemen met the British aligned Cherokee in the ravine behind where the old Dixon School was located, resulting in the first skirmish that day, which caused the Indians to retreat. Note that this marker was moved from Dixon School to the upper Five Points area after Dixon's school um, closed. Later that day, Captain James Thompson defeated Dragon Canoe in the Battle of Island Flats. This was called the first battle of the revolution in the West and was a turning point in the war with the Indians. By 1776, William Russell and the Fincastle Rangers had built Fort Patrick Henry on or near where Fort Robinson was. This fort covered three acres on the bluff on the north side of the South Holston River near the east end of Long Island. About 2,400 militia from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia routed the Cherokee, forcing the Indians to sue for peace, which led to the Avery Treaty of 1777. This remark, this replacement marker on John B. Dennis, if you notice, the, the name Captain Witcher, which was the old sign, was changed for some reason to Captain, to Captain Winchester. Joe Jefferson pointed this out to the Historical Commission last year, and I also talked to, to Lynn about this, <clears throat> and they had, no, they had no idea why it was changed. Joe was sensitive to this, since uh, Captain Witcher is your fifth great-grandfather or something like that. <laughs> so he was a little bit uh, concerned that, that the historical marker no longer gave reference to Captain Witcher. Okay. <clears throat> and again, the Avery Treaty relinquished a large portion of Indian land uh, to the white settlers who again violated the treaty later on. In 1779, John Donaldson shows up again. This time, he's headed west on a 1,000 mile journey to Nashville with a flotilla of canoes and flatboats and about 300 adventurers. They left Fort Patrick Henry in December 1779 and made it about a mile down the river before they ran aground at Reedy Creek. <laughs> they had to remain near the current boat yard for about two months repairing their boat and waiting for more water to come into the Holston River. They made it finally to the Nashville area by April 1780. This sign is in the Netherlands area. It was erected by the Boy Scouts, Troop 220. It's by the river, it's a wooden sign, and it's not in the greatest shape as you can see. But the, it also uh, adds that Donaldson's <coughs> flatboat was, the, was named the Adventurer, and it's, it states that about 600 yards upstream from where the sign is, because it's downstream from Reed Creek. So, so those are about the only two changes there between, between the historical marker and the one that the Boy Scouts put. <coughs> I'm sure you recognize the name Yanchich Tavern. It's become, it's become a, I don't know if you want to call it a battle cry or a cry, 
for 126 preservation when they're, as they're trying to widen 126 on out to the interstate. Uh, they want to make sure that the integrity of Gancy Tavern is maintained and the graves on, on uh, East Lawn are not disturbed when they build a bigger road. So yes. Gancy Tavern <coughs> James Hollis built a house in 1779 on Island Road, which over the time has served as a tavern, a courthouse, an inn, a post office, a stagecoach stop, and finally a farm. It has been owned by John Yancey, John Shaver, and John Spar. It was also the, the, well, the Sullivan, County, uh, Sullivan County Courthouse from 1780 to 1792. The small marker by the steps leading up to the, to the porch was placed by the Association for the Preservation of Tennessee Antiquities. It's another group. By 1802, William King had purchased two lots in Christiansville and established a boat yard where flatboats loaded with many goods could go down the river. It was an important port and the highest point of navigation on the Holston River. William King could be said to be the Salt King because he came from Saltville, Virginia, and his, his main product was salt. And he started the boat yard <coughs> so that he could transport salt, primarily, to New Orleans and, and places south via the river because it was a heck of a lot cheaper than trying to do it via overland by wagon. Um, okay, now, James King, Colonel James King, was the Iron King. He built an iron furnace, which was the first ironworks in Tennessee. He hauled his goods, his iron goods, to the confluence of the North Holston and the South Holston rivers. So it was cheaper to haul it, obviously, by water than it was by wagon load. He had to haul it about 25 miles in a wagon before it got here. Some people say that King's Port is due to James King. Other people, Brianna included, think it's William King who had the first two lots there and the boatyard. Okay? What were the King's brothers or what were they related? No, they're told that they're not they're not related at all that I could tell. James King came from Ireland. Uh, immigrated in from Ireland and he was a colonel uh, and served in the Revolutionary War. He was captured by the British and he escaped and then resigned his commission because he didn't want to give up the horse that he had gotten from a British officer that he knocked off the horse. <laughs> and uh, the quartermaster wanted the horse and he said, the heck with that, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Well, he had, he had a change of heart, and he ended up being at, um, um, well, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank right now. When Cornwallis was surrendered well, at Yorktown, yeah. he was there. Yeah. So that's, that's the Colonel James King. William King is just down here in Kingsport, going from Saltville and carrying his salt around. Flat boats like this one carry these goods on the Holston River, and there were probably, would you say, Alex, there were about a thousand of them that were built or more, wow. at least, that, that, that uh, worked on there. Um, Alex coordinated the project to build this boat as part of the Netherlands Restoration, 
and the beautification of the of the island park area. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this built was put on a concrete pad and was never intended to 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 be waterborne. But in 2013, it came within about that much of floating out due to a little flood. <laughs> so he almost he almost got the launch's boat due to that flood. So that was kind of interesting there. <coughs> By 1806, most of the Cherokee land in this area had been ceded to the white settlers. The last to go was Long Island. Although Long Island is Tennessee's first national historic park, the National Park Service recommended that the designation be removed because of heavy industrialization of the island. This is kind of a good news, bad news. Good news is that you had jobs and industry coming in, bad news is that you lost the historical uh, integrity of the island. So, and that was in 1996, and I couldn't find a reference of whether it was officially removed, but on the Tennessee um, Antiquities website, uh, it was listed under those items that have been removed. So I'm assuming that Long Island is no longer <clears throat> a National Historic Landmark. By 1818, the Netherlands was established with the purchase of King's Boat Boatyard by Richard Netherland, and it was operated as an inn and a boatyard for almost 100 years. Uh, and and uh, <clears throat> Netherland Inn is the only site on the registry of historic places that was both a stagecoach stop and a boatyard. It's the only one. As part of the, the restoration of the Netherlands area, they rebuilt the bank barn. It's called a bank barn because it's built on a bank. <laughs> the top of the barn, the top level, is where they drove, where they, uh, where, where they drove the stagecoaches in for repair, or the, or the wagons for repair, and the bottom is where they housed all the horses. So that's, that's really what a bank barn is. I always thought it was something where you put money. <laughs> also, this is the start at the Netherland End area of Daniel Boone's Wilderness Trail. <clears throat> it's also the excuse <clears throat> me. It's also the I guess the ceremonial head of that trail. Notice there's a, a log cabin when well, you might not be able to see it too well in that picture. There's the log cabin down to the lower right of the, of the display, and that was Daniel Boone and Rebecca Boone's log cabin that was in Duffield, Virginia. It was taken down and removed and moved to here, and it's in behind the Netherland Inn. Daniel and Rebecca actually resided in that cabin <clears throat> for two years, in 1775 and 1776, I believe. Exchange Place, also known as the Gaines Preston Farm. It's a living history farm. It began as a 3,000 acre land grant to Edmund Pendleton in 1756. John Gaines received 160 acres for services in the War of 1812 and grew it to 2,000 acres. Gaines wanted to go back to Virginia and exchanged the property with John Preston. It could be said that the exchange name could be attributed to the exchange of horses for the stagecoaches or the exchange of property between Gaines and Preston or the fact that there was an exchange of Virginia and Tennessee currency because of the location. There is a story that as John Preston was touring the, the, the land, he came upon a tree down by Reedy Creek. 
and carved into that tree was Daniel Boone killed a bear on this tree in 1775. And according to the story, that sold James Preston on wanting to have that land. <laughs> Uh, I understand, although I have not, I did not verify this or did not <coughs> see it myself, that a replica of that is at the exchange place. If anybody's seen that, um, is that true or not? I don't know. It is a living and working farm. The next, the next uh, event at exchange place will be the fall uh, folk art festival it's usually a lot of fun um, October which is when and on December the 7th Christmas in the country so those are some upcoming events at exchange place On Long Island, across from where, where Evergreen Nursery used to be is Don Tark Park. <clears throat> Don Tark Park has eight baseball fields uh, arranged in a, in a wheel of four and then another wheel of four. Each one of those has a, has a central concession stand and building uh, for each of those four ball fields that are on either one of those areas. These signs are there at the park one for each of the one is for each of those buildings and they relate to all the history of the Cherokee and that some of the like the numbers three four and seven hold special meaning to the Cherokee the water spider the bear claw and the medicine wheel are all are all part of that uh, history so I guess if a Cherokee gets on an airplane it's pretty good if he's in a 737 or a 747. <laughs> also on Long Island, there is a monument to the return of 3.61 acres to the Cherokee, to the Eastern tribe of the Cherokee by um, Mayor Bevington in, in 1976. That monument lists the seven clans of the Cherokee, the wolf, bear, paint, wild potato, long hair, bird, and blue clan. And this is the placard that's there that commemorates their return to Chief John Crow of the Cherokee Nation. This, the, the walking bridge in the Netherlands area goes across, and as soon as you get over to Long Island, this is the Long Island, this is the, the Long Island end. As soon as you get to Long Island, this monument is within 10 feet of the end of that bridge. Uh, I noticed that there was some damage to the brick to the sign the stone is missing and if you go back there are quite a few pot marks on the stone I don't know how that happened unless somebody threw rocks at it also there are three churches that are that that are uh, on the Tennessee Historical Commission markers this is Taylor's Meeting House. It was probably the first church in Tennessee. Acuff's Chapel, which was the first Methodist Episcopal Church in Tennessee. It also held a 10-day revival oh, wow. <laughs> in, in the late 1700s. And that's the chapel that resides on 126 just past Interstate 81. These two churches are outside the boundary that I set for myself, but since they were so close, I went ahead and included them. And then 
this marker is for the old Presbyterian Church, which serves the boatyard. It's across the street from the entrance to Hunter Wright Stadium, across across uh, eight, uh, in the eleven W. The church itself was moved from the boatyard area on up uh, to its current location behind this. Uh, I don't think it's Greenway Street, but. But uh, that sign said Greenway Street. I took a picture of it. It's on the National <coughs> Register of Historic Places also. Places. First one is back to old sign works. And that was built by Moses, Moses Cabot and acquired by John Sevier and his son and later the N.E. <coughs> uh, Roadmasters. <coughs> That factory was operated by Jonathan Wexler. As you remember, Colonel James King uh, also had an iron works, but his partner was Governor William Blunt. Here's, a, here's one that I had no idea what this one was, Rock Ledge. It's on Bloomingdale Pike. And it was a it was a home that's been in the same family lineage for six generations, and uh, it is also on the National Registry. Douglas High School. This one is unique in all the signs in the Kingsport area, in that the front and the back are different. Most of the road markers that the THC puts up are the same on the front and the back, so you can read them from the front of the back. This one, you can see this little continued right here. They continued it on the back side, so you had to, you had to see both sides to get the full story. Douglas High School, first and only uh, African-American school in Kingsport, and it, and it had Kindergarten through the 12th grade. Its last class was in 1966. Finally, Wexler Bend Pilot Plant. This marker is below the bridge on John B. Dennis that goes across the Holston. Thanks to, to Terry, I found it. <laughs> it's not easy to find because it, it says, uh, this is a private road, but that private road is not a private road. When you go off the road and go back around under the bridge and come back up again, you're still okay. So this, this marker is down there, and it commemorates the Wexford Bend Power Plant, pilot plant that was started in 26 days in World War II for the continuous production of RDX. The most, the most energetic, explosive, before the atomic bomb. Finally, the Battle of Kingsport. Really, the Battle of Kingsport is kind of like the Battle of Thermopylae, I think that's how you'd say that, where the Greek 300 tried to, tried to hold off uh, the Persian force of maybe 100,000. And all, all the 300 Warrior, Greek warriors were actually killed. Um, in this case, the 300 Confederates got outflanked by 5,500 Union soldiers. They came to the confluence of the North Holston and the South Holston River. Uh, the, the Union had been marching up in December um, for three days, and they came to Rotherwood and the footbridge, they could not cross it. So, and the Confederates were on the other side, <clears throat> on, the, on the Kingsport side of the, of the river. Um, the Union soldiers, they sent two regiments on north until they could come to a ford. They forded the river and came on back down on the Confederate side and routed, and routed the Confederate force killing 15 or wounding 15, killing and wounding 15, capturing 85, 
along with 13 wagons of supplies. And again, there is a Confederate marker down by the walking trail uh, that, was, that was placed by the John Mosley chapter. And this is the, the left one is the front of it. And then on the back is how the Confederate, the daughters of the Confederate, sons, sons of the Confederacy uh, explained the battle. Okay, that brings us to the next portion. It's called the Downtown Heritage Trail. Downtown Heritage Trail. If you go to the Downtown Kingsport Association, they have these maps. The maps are outlined in yellow, shows the trail that you can walk in Downtown Kingsport. There are 27 markers for the trail right now. 10 of which are large signs. Starting with number one, which is the Jim Theater. The one thing about that is that Jimmy Quillen sold tickets to it <laughs> when, when it was a movie theater. <laughs> Followed by the Kingsport Drugstore first drugstore in Kingsport, and the doctors had offices in the building on the second floor. The Bank of Kingsport, 1912, went under in the, in the uh, Depression, declared insolvent. The train depot, although in 1953, passenger service was discontinued, which for us rail fans, that's not, that's not so, so hot, but uh, it is also on the National Registry of Historic Places. Dobbins Taylor, interesting building. There's no, there's no large sign for it, but it was Dobbins Taylor Hardware. <clears throat> A unique store to say the least. You could go into one side, on the lower side, and you could buy black powder, you could buy sporting equipment, you could buy all kinds of stuff in that one side. You could walk up a little ramp, go to the back, you could buy appliances. You, there, was, there were washers and dryers back there, and it went all the way up and came out on Shelby Street on the back. Okay, and then, and then you could go on up a little bit further, and there was fine china, and there was crystal, and there was also a jewelry store. When I was at OCS, I was an officer candidate making all of $200 a month. <laughs> I had asked my first wife to marry me if I got my commission. So at Christmas time, I was here on Christmas leave from OCS, and uh, my, my fiance had come down, she, she was from Portsmouth, Virginia, and so she came down to visit my parents, and I was going to surprise her with a ring. So I went to see Mr. Red Cloud over on the jewelry side, and he sold me a, a nice keepsake ring. Well, I didn't have any money. You know, $200 a month didn't go very far. Uh, <clears throat> so I bought it on time. I got com my commission on the 2nd of February, 1968. I got married on the 4th of February, 1968, 2468, so I can always remember that one. <laughs> and and uh, while she was here at Christmas time, I gave her that ring, which surprised her. She didn't think I was going to do that, but, but that, that's beside the story. Well. <coughs> Five weeks later, I'm on a destroyer headed to Vietnam. My wife is now paying for her ring <laughs> with bills from Dobbins Taylor Hardware. And she never let me forget that her engagement ring came from a hardware store. <laughs> so, you have to have grown up in Kingsport to really appreciate the uniqueness of Dobbins Taylor. Unfortunately, it's no longer with us. 
and this brass plaque is the only thing that's there. <laughs> when, when did Dobbins Taylor go out of business officially? I'm sorry? When did Dobbins Taylor officially That's go out a good of business? question because I, I didn't come back until about five years ago. I was gone from from uh, essentially 1968 until 2001, 13? Yeah. Something like that. So does anybody know when Dobbins Taylor or Quickly and Dobbins Taylor? It was still here in the early 70s. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I shopped there some. I bought a few things, you know, hardware items. Yeah, but it was, it's interesting because, uh, well, that's another story, but they would sell black powder to just about anybody, including me. You could blow up whatever. The jewelry store is still there. I'm sorry? The jewelry store is still there. Yeah. Yes. Jewelry is it, is it, but it's not called Diamond Taylor anymore. Is it still a jewelry store? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. There's, a, there's a gun shop there someplace right, yeah. right close yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And George Taylor still owns all of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they still have the stock from 1960 in there. Okay. And they still have a yearly meeting at the Taylor family about what to do. All right. That's good. I, you know, it's it's still part of Kingsport history, yep. and it and it's a unique place. I don't I don't know of too many people in or too many stores in the 20th century that that had that diverse an offering. Jerry, the, back there by the China too, they also sold Lionel trains. <laughs> oh yes, they did. We, we had to, we couldn't leave out Lionel trains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The State Theater showed movies there for around, I don't know, 36 years or so. Wonderful place to take a date when, when I was growing up and we consumed lots and lots of bags of popcorn. <laughs> the Western Union Building, 1932 I believe. Yeah. yeah. Where they could actually send and receive Western Union telegrams. Kingsport Public Library houses Brianna and then the archives now, <laughs> among other things. Shelby Street Row houses, this is significant because George Eastman, when he came here, was impressed that only Days, I guess, days after his his visit, where he was thinking about relocating an alcohol plant, that Kingsport was already building row houses for the, the Eastman employees. Kind of interesting. Church Circle, it's unique. It's also on the National Registry of Historic Places. Now, the Downtown Heritage Trail, although this is not part of it, I couldn't leave that out. <coughs> because it reminded me so much of all the great golf courses around that have a, that have a <clears throat> clock similar to this by the clubhouse. I think it's kind of a neat clock. Yep. But the last one is the Kingsport Improvement Building, 1917, where the, where the first board of and aldermen met. Also, not on, not specifically on the Downtown Heritage Trail, but just around the corner from the Kingsport Improvement Building and across the street from the KACL Continuing Education Building is a police memorial, which is a memorial to all the police officers who have lost their lives on duty from 1919 forward. And there's a perpetual flame right here. Uh, as a memorial to those police officers who have lost their lives. <clears throat> National Registry of Historic Places. In addition, in addition uh, to the Netherland Inn, the Boatyard, Exchange Place, Rock Ledge, the Train Depot, and Church Circle, there are 10 additional places in Kingsport that are on the National Registry of Historic Places. I left off the Long Island of the Holston because I'm not sure 
whether it's still um, a national landmark or not uh, due to the, the National Park Service in 1996. Here's four of them, Mount Ida, which is up on Severe Terrace. Grassdale, I've often wondered what that one was. It's down there across from the glass building for the Holston um, Medical Group, across Bloomingdale and right there on John, uh, on close. Stone Drive. I'm sorry. Gross are close, family live there. Gross close live there too, yeah. correct, correct. But it's called Grassdale, yeah. that's the name that it is under the National Registry. The Alexander Dog Farm, it's out there where Terry lives, it's off of Prophet Lane. It, it, and um, this stone, this stone is right down over here in the corner. It says the in Rock Haven Farm, established in 1823. <coughs> and George Washington School is on the registry. That surprised me. On Watauga Street, there are three homes that are on the registry. The J. Fred Johnson House, the Stone Pen House, and the Martin Dobbins House. Fort Patrick Henry Hydroelectric Dam. Boone Hydroelectric Dam is also on the National Registry, but that was outside the limit that I cut for myself. Um, it's on the other side of 81. The Pierce Chapel AME Church Cemetery off of Seaver Road, and that's over past Meadowview Park Parkway. Uh, it's interesting because they say that the criteria for National Historic Places usually do not include churches, although we have a couple of churches that are on it. Um, they, and they don't include cemeteries unless there's some significance to the cemetery. This one, this one in fact, the, the uh, Pierce Chapel has long since gone. This one has one little sign up in the corner that says National Registry of Historic Places, and it's hard to find. I drove down the road and turned around and said, well, there it is. <laughs> now, the bottom one and the last one, the Looney Moses House, which was a fortified house. Um, it's on the National Registry. In, in 2008, it looks like people were living in it. It was well kept. I drove by this thing about three different times because it was all overgrown. I said, and then I said, you know, I think that looks like the house. And it is the house. But it's abandoned and it's fallen into disrepair. Under, under these siding, there is a log cabin. And that was the fortified log cabin that Richard IV. Okay. Uh, a word house? about the. Where is that house? Where is where is the? Do um, you know where Crockett Ridge Golf Course is on Old Island Road? On Island Road. Well, after you go past Crockett Ridge, you go up the hill and turn a little bit, and it's on the left. But it's completely overgrown. It's very easy to drive by it three or four times. That door to I did it. <laughs> Uh, a word about the historical marker program. And these are the areas. And markers can't be sponsored by individuals or organizations uh, if you could come up with the, with the $1,450 to pay for the marker after it's approved. It still has to meet the right criteria. But if you can come up with the, with the money, uh, they can pay for it, even though the, the Tennessee Historical Commission has a very limited budget uh, to, to put these new ones up. The only one I was wondering about whether there should be a road marker from the Tennessee Historical Commission would be Exchange Place. There is no marker for Exchange Place. There is no marker for Netherland Inn. A roadside marker for Netherland Inn. But there's one for the boat yard. There's one for Long Island. They're, you know, they're all right there in a the row. So I can understand why Netherland Inn doesn't have one. But I was wondering if, in fact, 
it would be worth trying to get a marker for exchange place. Just a thought. And as a, as a last, I would like to thank the people that have helped me and the websites in trying to get these together. Now, I see Alex is coming with the hook. <laughs> uh, I wanted to add one other item here. Now, was Kingsport named for William King or James King? No, Joe Board. Or is it King's plural port? So which one is it? Anybody have any anybody have a guess? Anybody want to venture a guess? Brianna would not take a side, so she had she she just said, you know. There's a controversy as to who this was really named after. I've always thought it was William King. But a case could be made for, for James. James King. I guess a case could be made for both of them. <laughs> Since they all went to the same port. <laughs> Any comments? Questions? And there was well, a, what were the boundaries of your search? You mentioned the Virginia state line and what's that? The boundaries for your uh, oh, it was Virginia state line yeah. eighty one and the south, southern and eastern boundaries. Virginia, I just I just arbitrarily cut it off at the Virginia state line, right? And then arbitrarily cut it off on the western side, which was the North Fork of the Holston River. So I didn't go to Rotherwood. I didn't go. I didn't go to Churchill and all the ones down through there. Uh, also, the the south uh, Holston, the south branch of the Holston River, uh, although the Avery and and Donaldson are on Long Island, Long Island is really the the, the bottom portion. So the tributary or the sluice that goes along would be the bottom boundary, and then on the on the east side, I chose I-81, and there's uh, there are two markers uh, that are past that, and then one of the <coughs> national historical <coughs> excuse me places also is out by Colonial Heights and on the other side of and on the other side of 81. Hey Jerry, on the Grassdale, um, interesting little story on that. Their address was across the street. They built a little, the, the gross clothes built a little shed across the street so that the gross clothes kids could go to city schools. Because Grassdale was in the county. So their and official address was a shed. Interesting aside, the other one, the other one that I, I had no idea of was, was Rock Ledge. That one, that one I had no idea, and I drove up and down um, Bloomingdale trying to find it. It's actually on a, I think it's called Stuffley or Stuffley. Stuffle 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 That's still Stuffley. Road, and it's down, it's down the hill yeah. and back into some bushes before I found it. Huh. It was on a historic tour one time. What's that? It was on a home tour one time. I know, I'm, as ba I'm as bad as Burr, so what is <laughs> I said it was on a home tour one time. I'm oh, it was? Yes, uh, it was? Yeah. Rockledge? Okay, cool. <laughs> I have about 15 copies of each of these, of each of the uh, signs that, that we discussed here. We, you can read them in detail. Um, if you're interested, if anybody's interested, well, they'll be up here on the, they'll be up here on the desk. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. That was great. There's so much more that can be said about this, and there's so much history just in these historical markers that, that, that it's really intriguing to listen to it. Uh, Ken, are you our program?